This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 97, recorded on August 23rd, 2010. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, and for the next few weeks, I'm on the road in California, and I thought I would stop in to several of my virology friends and talk to them about what they do. And the first stop is in Palo Alto, California, and I'm talking with Peter Sarno. Hey, Peter, welcome to TWIV. Oh, welcome. Yeah, it's great to be on your show. Peter is professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Stanford University School of Medicine. Did I get that right? That's correct. Peter's an old friend of mine, known you for many years since you started your postdoc. Right? That's right, yes. And Peter works on viruses, and we're going to talk a little bit about what he works on today. But first, I wanted to talk about how Peter came to be a virologist. I know that um, you were a postdoc with David Baltimore, at MIT, and you followed me. That's so as, right. just as I was finishing my postdoc, you began. That's right, and I remember you handed me over a, a test tube with a cDNA in it, and you told me this is infectious polio virus when you put it into cells, it and that's virus, where it started. Yeah. And that's what you used to work on for your postdoc, That's right? correct, yeah. And probably <clears throat> you still use it to this day. Right, right. And I'm glad I was of some use. <laughs> <laughs> Now, before you were a postdoc, you were you got your PhD at Stony Brook. That's correct. With Arnie Levine, mm -hmm. who was a really well-known virologist. Um, and then before that, you were a student in Germany. That's right. Because you were born and raised in Germany. That's right? right, in Konstanz, the southern part of Germany. And there I went to the University of Konstanz. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked in the laboratory uh, of Rolf Knippers, working on actually methylation of histones. So at that time, there was not a lot of interest in this. And it got triggered by Arne Levine coming uh, on sabbatical. And he had made antibodies, and he wanted to know whether histones assembled in vitro or even histones assembled from a bottle from Sig bought from Sigma mm. actually are modified. <laughs> and that's uh, how I started. Uh, yeah. So he came to your university on sabbatical. That's right. And so... That I, led you eventually to go doing your PhD with him. That's right. So I was paid to work with him, and the first thing he said to me, my name is Arnie, and that blew me away because I ex <laughs> I'm used to help Dr. Yeah. Professor. And uh, three months later, when he left, it was a short sabbatical, he asked me, uh, would you like to come to the States to do your PhD in my lab? And the next day, I came with my suitcase, and I said, where are we going? And he said, Stony Brook. And I had no clue where that was, but it didn't matter. So... Great. And I came to the States in 79. <laughs> so that's an example of how random things can happen and lead to a career. That's right. right. Yeah. It happens an awful lot. You just find an opportunity. Or as Dixon de Pommier, our, <clears throat> our co-host here, says, doors open and close along the way, and you just pick the one that you want to go into. That's right. So you came to the U.S. You had been in Germany your whole life, right? Right. And just said, I want to do this, I want to go work with Arnie Levine. You went to Stony Brook and you got a PhD. Right. What did you work on there? Well, initially uh, I worked on, uh, my project was to look what kind of proteins interact with adenovirus uh, E4 proteins, early E4 proteins, and I had a lot of antibodies made by actually Susan Ross, uh, who's a professor in, uh, at uh, Penn, at the University of Pennsylvania. And I co-immune precipitated uh, proteins such as uh, E1B50, 50, uh, 58 kilodalton protein. And then I looked in infected cells and transformed cells and realized suddenly that the E1B, 58 kilodalton protein, interacts with a cellular protein, and that turned out to be P53. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was kind of exciting and nice because the other half of the lab worked on P53 and its interaction with S340 large T antigen. And of course, at that time, we thought it's an oncogene because it's expressed in virus transform cells. So we didn't even think, you know, it, it's a tumor suppressor. So, uh, yeah, so I uh, discovered at that time that it also interacts with an adenovirus protein. So we thought it ought to be important in cellular transformation. 
So that was the beginning of our of the <coughs> work on P53, which now is an incredibly important. Right at that time, point. I think there were twenty publications, and I think yeah. today there are fifty thousand or so. I heard amazing. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. So I remember you told me you used to have three or four centrifuges running to do the amino precipitations. That's right. At a time, <coughs> each, each full of tubes. That's great. How did you decide to go work with David Baltimore? Right. So. Uh, yeah, so I did a lot of biochemistry as a graduate student, and I really wanted to lo learn the genetics, viral genetics. And uh, of course, I could have worked with uh, DNA viruses, but of course, at that time, you, Vince Reichenjello, uh, and uh, also my neighbors in Stony Brook were working on making a, a Eckhart Wimmer's lab, working on making a, a cDNA of poliovirus, and and you guys succeeded. And I thought, this is this is great. This is it. You know, you have a cDNA clone of an RNA virus, so this is ideal to learn genetics, to make mutations, and I felt this is kind of a whole new, yeah, a whole new door, a whole new frontier. And uh, so when I interviewed with Baltimore, I told him that's what I, what I would want to work with. And luckily for me, at that time, you were just about to move uh, to New York, to Columbia. Uh, he said, sure, I have an opening. <coughs> <laughs> and for me, luckily, so when I came up, I, you were very uh, generous and talking to me and because I've never worked with cDNA and uh, expressing DNA making mutants and uh, I think I remember we had a very good understanding what you will be doing and what yeah. I will be doing and so it was it was great it was a very good start for me that was 19, <clears throat> 1982 that's correct I think so this is the early days still of recombinant DNA because mm -hmm. when I had gone to David's lab the moratorium on cloning entire <clears throat> viral genomes had been just lifted. That was 1979. Right. And then there weren't many reagents available. You had to make a lot yourself. Right. So not, nowadays it's all routine and no one thinks twice about it, but it was an unusual time right. where we we're just learning to do this. So, you, by the way, if you hear um, chirping in the background, we <sighs> happen to be in Peter's house and he has chinchillas, right? Right. And they chirp. And they, it's a love bird. Sorry? And a love bird. Yeah, a love bird. Is, uh, <coughs> is it the love bird now? Mm -hmm. no, I thought right. that was a chinchilla. They sound very similar, right? right. <laughs> um, <coughs> so then you spent a couple of years learning virology and how to manipulate viruses by modifying DNA. Mm -hmm. And then you set off on your own. Right. You started your own lab at Boulder. No, sorry, University of De Colorado at Denver. That's correct. The right? Health Sciences Center, yeah. And at the time, then, you had also met Carla Kierkegaard, who has been on TWIV a couple of times. And the two of you got married and went to Colorado together. That's right. And she started her lab in Boulder mm -hmm. and yours in Denver. So you had to go somewhere where you could get two science positions. That's right. And that's a good... And they're an hour apart? That's correct, yeah. Yeah. So you started working on polio continuing to do that right and you got interested in translation of the that's genome. right so what happens uh, I uh, towards the end of my postdoc I focused on making mutations in the three prime non-coding regions of polio so uh, of course at that time uh, Sonnenberg and Wimmer's lab discovered irises internal ribosome entry sites and uh, that was very exciting and uh, of course I was uh, also interested in learning uh, how do irises work and being trained with Levine and thinking about virus-host interactions basically all my life, I was very curious if poliovirus and EMCV and cephalomyocarditis virus have irises. Well, are there cellular RNAs that have irises? And uh, because, as you know, viruses don't invent something new. They usually absorb something. And, of course, mm. they need the ribosome from the cell. So I was very curious about this. And I paid attention to, in my experiments, whether there would be cellular mRNAs that could be uh, translated mm. by an iris. So I thought, well, maybe some of the mutants I have that infect cells and grew kind of slowly and shut off host cell translation and transcription slowly, in this background, maybe I can detect cellular proteins still being synthesized. And so I discovered this 78 kilodalton protein that actually was still synthesized when you infect cells with mutant poliovirus that grew a little slower than wild type. And uh, at that time, of course, there was no proteomics available. So I cut this band, uh, radio labeled band out of a gel and I did uh, cleavage 
pattern analysis and discovered it was uh, the protein BIP, the immune globulin heavy chain binding protein, which is a chaperone in the ER. And it turns out this one has an iris. So I was very excited. Great, there are cellular RNA molecules that have an iris. So then during my next four years in Denver, uh, I really wanted to find out what's the difference between cellular irises and viral irises. Do they share similar factors? Are there more RNAs uh, available that have irises? And what is their normal function? So what, and then subsequently you found that many more irises probably exist right. in eukaryotic cells. What's the number roughly? I would say probably maybe five to seven percent, but uh, you have to, when you analyze, you have an iris, you have to analyze them carefully to make sure that the RNA is not broken, it's not a promoter activity, so usually maybe you lose half of them, when you do, uh, which pass all the tests. I think so at that time uh, people looked at uh, long leaders, maybe they are predicted to be translated, uh, mediate translation very poorly. But mm. if you know the protein is actually ra uh, made at an enhanced rate, uh, maybe there is an iris. So there were all these kind of speculations. But when I moved to Denver, uh, to, uh, to Stanford at that time, Pat Brown just developed a cDNA microarray. Then we had a whole new tool because now we didn't have to look what proteins are radio-labeled in polio-infected cells. Now we could just isolate polysomal RNA and do array analysis. Mm -hmm. So that's where suddenly a whole new uh, numbers uh, of uh, RNAs that could be translated in polio-infected cells were discovered. And then the question was, some probably have irises, maybe some on polysomes because they need very little of translation initiation factors, they're unstructured, but we had a whole new numbers of mRNAs to look at. So an iris allows the ribosome, <coughs> instead of having to bind to the very 5 prime end of the mRNA, it allows it to bind internally. Right. And for the picornas, that's needed because they turn off mechanisms of translation via the 5 prime end. Right. But why does a cell mRNA, most cell mRNAs are capped, right. and the cap at the 5 prime end recruits the ribosome. Right. So why would there be irises in cellular right. mRNAs? Right. So clearly all mRNAs, as we know, cellular mRNAs have a cap, so the ribosome will bind there. And it binds there by interacting with a cap binding protein, which mm -hmm. also interacts with a few translation factors. Right. So the 40S subunit of the ribosome binds there and then scans the RNA 5' prime to 3' prime until you have an AUG. Now we do know there are situations in the cell where the cap binding protein does not bind to the cap because it's not phosphorylated or it's sequestered by 4E, by cap binding proteins. Now during that time translation is slowed down during apoptosis for example or when you stress cells uh, by heat when you uh, when you deprive them of nutrition so the cell will slow down uh, translating. But of course the cell has to rebound so during that time when translation is poor because the cap binding proteins are not available, they're not functional, you need to synthesize, you need to translate a, a subset of mRNAs. So some of these mRNAs such as BIP for example, they do have uh, uh, internal ribosome entry sites so then the ribosome can bind independent of, uh, of uh, the availability uh, uh, of uh, cap binding proteins. Mm -hmm. And of course the other example is what we know from yeast, some Allen Hindebusch's lab. During that time when you have fewer, it's not an all or nothing, uh, of course, experiment uh, situation when 40S binds to the cap structure or maybe fewer 40S, they can reinitiate at upstream open reading frames and uh, uh, translate RNAs. So one of the <coughs> things that an iris allows in a viral genome is to have multi uh, messages, that is, mRNAs that can code for more than one protein right. by initiation and termination, not by processing. Right. Like the cricket paralysis virus genome has right. two open reading frames with an iris in the middle. Right. Are there any known examples? So th in a mammalian cell, in theory, <laughs> a of iris would allow um, multi mRNAs. Do we know any examples of that? No, not really, not really, but yeah. It's funny that they exist, but they're not yeah. used in that way, right? Yeah, but it, 
I should say uh, no one has described them. Doesn't mean they don't exist sure. because you would expect, as you know, so we have an RNA molecule. We look for an open reading frame. But of course, some mRNAs have long three prime known coding regions. And of course, there you also have open reading frames. So you really would have to look at it and test that directly whether the so-called three prime non coding region has an iris. Right, right. So, so it's probably worth <laughs> saying also that you can't tell an iris by looking at the sequence. That's right. right. That's right. You have to do a functional assay. That's right. So it's it's a lot of work. And, right. uh, and even now, I mean, people think, well, it's a complicated structure. So are there common features? And of course, mm -hmm. between, between picronaviral irises, there are some common features and some they are not common. But when you compare known uh, viral and cellular irises, the structures look very different. So we really don't know why do they, what is common? Why do they look so different? So sometimes I think, well, maybe an iris has evolved to be structured to keep maybe an important portion single-stranded, and maybe that single-stranded region can function like a shine dolgano sequence in bacteria to right. attract the ribosome. Right. So because sometimes I think, why should uh, an, uh, an iris in a mammalian cells functionally be very different from a, a sure. prokaryotic ribosome? Sure, sure. <clears throat> so you spent your years at Boulder working on these issues, then you moved to Stanford right. and expanded them. But then you also started to work on hepatitis C virus. Right. How did you get involved in that? Okay, so I started working with uh, HCV hepatitis C virus already in Denver because HCV also has an iris. And uh, my neighbor in Denver, Alim Siddiqui, who is now at uh, UC San Diego, uh, had worked with hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus. So I had someone I talked to every day and um, he had reagents available. So he was very interested in working with us on the iris. So, yeah, so I had already thought a lot about hepatitis C virus. So when I moved to Stanford, of course, I moved from a biochemistry department to a microimmunology department. And as you know, your neighbors and people surrounding you influence your thinking and your your thinking shifts a little bit and your interest shifts because you talk to your new neighbors and new colleagues. So at that time I started to think more and more about pathogenesis and of course influenced by Stan Falco. And I begin to think more about uh, how can hepatitis C virus, a positive stranded RNA virus, persist in the liver for 30 years and uh, how is this possible? And uh, so I thought, well, the virus must probably uh, shield itself from innate immune responses. Mm -hmm. Now, about five years ago, as you know, suddenly people discovered microRNAs, these small RNA molecules that have been missed because they are so small. And uh, as you know, they turn out to regulate uh, probably 10% uh, maybe or even more of uh, all genes in the cell. These are cellular RNAs. These are cellular RNAs, right. So tell, we never actually talked about microRNAs on right. TWIV. How are they made? By what enzymes in the cell? Right. So they are POL2 transcripts. Same enzyme that makes mRNA. That's right. RNA POL2. Uh, and uh, some, okay, they are long uh, POL2 transcripts. Some, some are coding and some are non-coding. Mm -hmm. So in the nucleus, there's a type 3, a type 3 uh, uh, endonuclease, it's called Torsha, that cleaves uh, this uh, long uh, Paul II transcript mm -hmm. into precursor microRNAs. And how long are they? 70 to 80 nucleotides in long. Okay. And uh, they are kind of structured, and their structure looks actually like VA RNA of adenovirus. Mm -hmm. They have a 5' prime phosphate and a 3' prime hydroxyl. Right. So this precursor microRNA then exits the nucleus via exporting 5 receptor it goes into the cytoplasm and there it's picked up by an enzyme DICER, it's also type 3 uh, endonuclease, and gets processed to a 22 nucleotide RNA molecule, which is then, of course, wrapped around uh, proteins, these are the so called argonaut proteins and some others, and then this RNA protein complex, which is referred to as RISC. RNA induced silencing complex will bind to target RNAs <coughs> if the very first uh, six to seven nucleotides are complementary to target mRNA sequences. Okay. And this complementarity, 
T has to be Watson and Crick base pair complementarity. There are a few exceptions. And then the, the three prime end of the microRNA interacts with imperfect base complementarity with the mRNA. So, so far people have found that microRNAs interact with three prime non-coding regions of mRNAs. And when the microRNA binds to the target mRNA, two things can happen. The RNA is translated more poorly or the RNA is degraded or both. Okay. And there's still debate what yeah. you know is more prevalent. So this, <clears throat> these microRNAs can target cellular mRNAs right. so right. that it regulates itself or other, it could target viral RNAs right. as well. So, right, so to, to come back uh, to my interest in pathogenesis, right. I was, I learned that in the liver there are many microRNAs and there is one, it's called microRNA 1 to 2, it's only expressed in the liver. And there is a huge amount of this microRNA in a normal liver, about 60,000 copies per liver cell. Now in transformed liver cells, in cultured cells, uh, the, the number of this microRNA drops up to 5,000. So there's this huge microRNA, huge number of microRNA 1 to 2 in the liver. And of course, if you look at the long, the 10,000 nucleotide HCV RNA genome, you would, you can find binding sites for predicted binding sites for this microRNA. So I thought, well, if this microRNA binds to HCV, how can HCV, is HCV not targeted? How can it persist? So I realized that there were three binding sites, two at the very, very five prime end of the genome and one in the three prime non-coding region. So of course, because of convention, as I mentioned to you, had it that three prime non-coding region are target for microRNAs. I looked and tested whether one to two binding to HCV RNA in cultured cells has functional consequences on RNA abundance and the answer was no. To our surprise we find, and this work was done by Catherine Chopling, a postdoc who is now an assistant professor at the University of Nottingham in England. She finds that uh, microRNA 1 to 2 when bound to the 5 prime end of the HCV genome actually enhances microRNA abundance. So that was the opposite what what the dogma is, binding of a microRNA enhances RNA abundance. But and what about the targets in the three prime end? We have no evidence no so far in tissue culture that okay. is important. But as you know, very often we get these results and then when we work in an animal model, we, we yeah, find, sure. no, indeed they are important. Okay. So I don't want to, yeah, I don't know what they're found. So the case, micro mir, which we call <coughs> mir 122 binding to the five prime target in hep C increases the amount of viral RNA. That's correct. Now, now we can actually do virus infections of hep C, which right. maybe when you did this work, that wasn't possible. That's correct. That was one with replicon cells, yeah. So can you, does it have an effect on virus particle production as well? A positive effect? Right. I think as a consequence, it has some, yeah. So what we think is, uh, what's the mechanism? How mm. does it maintain its CV RNA abundance? We know it has an effect one to five to twofold on trans rates of translation. Uh, it doesn't seem to have uh, effects on rates of replication if you measure uptake of nucleotides. So we think uh, it uh, it regulates RNA turnover. So if you uh, inactivate microRNA one to two, and you can do this by so-called antisense oligonucleotides, they're called antagomers. Mm -hmm. uh, you can inactivate microRNA one to two, and you lose HCV RNA very rapidly, and we think it's degraded quickly. And so as a result, okay. of course, you have less, uh, you have fewer particles being made. This uh, uh, microRNA, how did it arise that it would enhance the, the viral replication? It obviously wasn't there. It has some other function in the cell. Right. Do we know what that is, by yes, the way? Yes, yes, we do know. Its, its main function is, uh, of course, it has microRNA 1 to 2 binds to predicted 100 mRNA molecules. We know from studies done in mice, rats, and actually also in monkeys, that the microRNA 1 to 2 upregulates cholesterol levels and, and fatty acid biosynthesis. So if you sequester microRNA 1 to 2 in animals, uh, by adding antagomers, you lower both liver and plasma cholesterol levels of these animals. So that's its normal function. Hmm. And we think 
we're still trying to figure out what is the target by which it upregulates cholesterol levels. And we think it targets an inhibitor of cholesterol levels. So that's why it has a positive right. effect. So we think that uh, this microRNA was there, is there in the liver, so it is in such huge abundance. So HCV just subverted it to protect its end. So yeah, the virus, whenever it arose, it evolved to utilize this right. in a positive fashion. That's right. So has it, the effect on cholesterol level is interesting. So are companies looking at antagomeres as a way of regulating cholesterol? Yes, right, absolutely. And um, so as you know, we have good statins and drugs out there, but uh, not everybody can use them. So I think people, uh, there are a few companies who work on antagomeres. But of course, they also are interested, can we at the same time target hepatitis C virus? So uh, there's one important study, uh, one important paper that came out last year in science, uh, headed by Robert Landford at UT um, Texas Southwestern, together with Santaris, a company in Copenhagen, uh, Denmark. What they have done is they have uh, taken antagomeres, and uh, they are modified in a special way. They are so-called locked nucleic acids. So locked nucleic acids, they have a, a, a oxymethylene group between the C2 and the C4 of the ribose. So they kind of flip in a conformation, these little uh, oligonucleotides, that they are very stable in the blood. They're very stable. And if you take these antagomeres and you put them in the bloodstream of uh, an animal, for example, they go straight into the liver. They stay in the liver for about seven weeks, sequester microRNA 1 to 2, cholesterol levels drop in these animals, and then after seven weeks, the, the LNA gets the antagomere, the LNA gets secreted via the kidney. So it's a temporal effect. Hmm. And then, of course, the cholesterol levels rebounds in these animals. Now, we do have chimpanzees available that are chronically infected with hepatitis C virus. So Santaris and Robert Landford use these animals to inoculate them with LNAs, so antagomeres against microRNA 1 to 2. And again, what happens, these LNAs went into the liver, and for seven weeks, hepatitis C virus levels dropped two and a, two and a half logs. And after, two and a, after seven weeks, the levels of HCV rebound, and of course, the LNA got secreted from the animal. Now, the important question was, how does the genotype look like of the virus that rebound after seven weeks? So deep sequencing was uh, was performed. Of course, that means that millions and millions of sequences could be analyzed, and not a single nucleotide change in the predicted microRNA binding site was found. That was stunning to me because I was sure I would have bet a lot of money that it simply makes one or two mutations and grabs another microRNA sure. because the interactions are not that stringent. But that didn't happen. Now that told me it's not as simple. This microRNA, these two microRNA binding sites are very, very important, and it's probably a more higher-order structure, which is very important for hepatitis C virus. And of course, this is very exciting, because now we can start to think, maybe we can treat animals or maybe people with an antagomere for seven weeks and drop viral load. And the good thing is it's it's a permanent, right? It's, a, it's not a permanent uh, treatment. It's a a, a tramparole treatment, and uh, maybe during that time, these people who wouldn't respond to interferon treatment maybe can be treated with interferon, and the viral load would drop more. Sure. It's amazing. So many things about this are amazing. First, that it's sequestered in the liver for seven weeks, and then, then it's released. That's just serendipity, right? It it's, gets secreted, yeah, via the kidney. It's, as you know, a lot of yeah. stuff gets taken up by the liver and gets secreted. Uh, so this via is a typical kidney. pattern where something right. would be sequestered in the liver for a while and then it's eventually It's pharmacokinetics, yeah. But isn't it possible that after multiple... So the, and I, the idea would be that if you, in humans who are chronically infected, you would have to give them periodic multiple doses. Right. Isn't it possible that after multiple That's doses right. you would get viral variants emerging that are resistant? Right. Right, that's right. That's that's one concern. But even more, we, as I said, we don't know what are the other targets, cellular targets for one to two. So if you think about them on, on a more permanent basis, you worry that maybe it could be oncogenic. Sure. So you, so what has to be done are more long-term animal studies first, 
to see if there are any right. such side effects. Right. right. Actually, Santaris, the company I mentioned, has finished phase one and one and one B clinical mm -hmm. trials so far. That means these are trials on healthy human volunteers, and they were treated with antagonists and. Uh, uh, the, these studies have not been published yet, but uh, Santaris has given talks uh, about them, mm -hmm. and they have said that these volunteers are fine, and their cholesterol levels has dropped as predicted, and they did not observe any liver inflammation or any abnormal uh, uh, blood. Uh, but of course, that's yeah. a year probably study. So you could argue that maybe it takes five years or sure, ten years. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. But that's how a drug is typically tested. You would only do a, right. a short-term right. side effect study, but then you would go into efficacy and right. eventually license it. And right. then hopefully in the long term, if it's licensed, you don't see any side effects. Right. Now, so you, had, you had originally said <laughs> that you thought the virus would change one or two nucleotides and then recruit a different microRNA to, fu to fulfill the same function. Right. In other words, it needs. So if, so my question is, if you change in the viral genome the microRNA binding site, does that reduce viral RNA levels? Well, no, it actually it kills the virus. It kills it. Yeah, yeah so that's right. So any change that will prevent MIR-122 binding kills the viral, right. so it cannot replicate. Right, and we have also made chimeric molecules where we know that the microRNA-122 should bind, but its 3 prime end was exchanged with sequences from other microRNA that, again, will not fulfill the function. Yeah. So the entire 22 nucleotide microRNA-122 needs to bind at two tandem sites by a perfect 50 nucleotide spacer. So now we know from very recent data that actually the microRNA 1 to 2 that binds to the very 5 prime end, actually the 3 prime end of the microRNA sticks out kind of at the 5 over, has an overhang, right. 3 prime overhang of the viral genome. So we think it protects the viral RNA either from degradation by nucleases or it might protect it from recognition by innate um, from innate immune responses. For example, we really don't know what exactly what does the end look like of the HCV RNA genome. Does it have a cap, which I doubt. There's no evidence that HCV has a capping enzyme, but West Nile has one, of course, and dengue, but for HCV, there's no uh, evidence for this. Does it have a triphosphate? If it has a triphosphate, of course, it should be targeted by Rig I. Mm -hmm. uh, the retinoic acid inducible gene, or if it has a monophosphate, it should be targeted by XRN1, which is a 5 prime, 3 prime uh, exonuclease. Sure. And if it has a monophosphate, it should be even more uh, susceptible. So that's why we think the binding of 1 to 2 is kind of a shield, probably, which regulates turnover. Why don't we know what's at the 5 prime end of the RNA? Is it difficult to figure that out? Yeah, it's. Uh, we have been working on this for half a year so far. It's just very, very tricky. It should be easy. I'm not quite sure. It's just not so easy to work with a 10,000 nucleotide RNA molecule, isolate the end, have enough of it. That it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not easy. So that's one of the things you're trying to figure out in your lab, how this microRNA enhances viral levels. That's yeah. right. So in terms of this as a therapeutic target, where do you see that going? Because there are other Hep C antivirals in the pipeline now that target protease and RNA polymerase. And how would this mesh with that? Would, it, would there be combinations or? Yeah, right. I think as, as you know right now, the only uh, therapy, the only drugs that really work efficiently is interferon ribavirin. But it's very hard to uh, treat people long term with interferon. And uh, not many people respond, so mo many people don't respond to interferon treatment. So in the field, there is a very a much concerted effort to go away from interferon-based treatment. So yes, yeah, so there are many drugs in the pipeline which are not interferon-based. And the idea, the hope, is to have a cocktail and to have a combo mm -hmm. drug, which, as you know, has worked very well so far for HIV patients. And maybe one to two could be part of it maybe one to two could be used uh, to lower the yield initially once right. the virus has been identified. But again, I would be cautious. We really don't know whether we can sequester one to two long term. Right. <clears throat> Interesting possibilities.
Are there any known, other known examples where a microRNA enhances viral levels aside from this one? No, that's the only, the only one. Because yeah. in all the other cases, the microRNAs inhibit right, right. viral replication, right? right? So we know that, uh, of course, uh, SV40, uh, Don Ganem's lab has one of the first to show that SV40, semen virus 40, uh, encodes a microRNA that downregulates uh, large T antigen expression. And now we know that, that all uh, herpes viruses encode microRNAs. And uh, the herpes virus encoded microRNAs downregulate uh, uh, genes that uh, would uh, that uh, are pro apoptotic. So there are mi there are viral encoded microRNAs right. that interfere with cell functions that would otherwise eliminate right. infection. Are there cellular microRNAs that inhibit viral replication? Yes. Uh, I don't know of any. No. There are some reports out there, but I'm not. Yeah, I'm you know, not, they're you, not that solid. Yeah, I don't remember exact details. Cesari published a paper years ago saying that interferon induces, among other things, lots of microRNAs that right. target. Right. And I think he looked at Hep C. Right. So that's one of the examples you're thinking about, maybe. Yeah. So there are certainly viral microRNAs that inhibit cellular right, right. processing. So this is amazing. So the discovery of small RNAs opens up a whole new fields of understanding not just ways to inhibit viruses, but right. the ways that the genome right. itself is regulated. Right. It's amazing. And all new approaches, all new yeah. chemical, biochemical approaches to right. studying this. And also now we, of course, we know that uh, microRNA move from cell to cell. And there is a, uh, also a lot of uh, effort is being made to figure out how do microRNAs move. And the idea is that they move via vesicular bodies from cell to cell. So if you can imagine a, a cell is infected by a virus, and of course if you look you find microRNAs go up and some go down. So microRNAs that are uh, elevated in their abundance, they can move to the neighboring cell. So mm -hmm. of course you can have scenarios where you think uh, antiviral state or proviral state might be, sure. might be elicited. So there's, so, really, I didn't know that, so there's evidence yeah. of vesicular movement of microRNAs. Right. So is this just during virus infection or also in normal cells? Also in normal cells. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How about our old friend polio? Do we know any microRNAs that interfere or enhance polio in any way? No, we don't know. There are microRNA targets in the genome, right? That's right, yeah. But no one has looked no. to see if they have any consequence. That's right. I think there are some reports out there where people profile microRNAs in polio-infected cells and they change, but uh, I don't think there are any functional studies have any functional studies have been done. Hmm. Yeah. So what's the what's the future of your research? Where is it heading? Are you continuing to work on MIR-122 uh, to understand how it works, but right. what other avenues are you looking at? Okay, so then <laughs> one is, of course, we want to know, does MIR-122 move from cell to mm -hmm. cell in HCV-infected cells? And there's a whole new level of complexity, and this is uh, microRNAs, uh, they actually modified at the ends. They have uh, extra nucleotides at the 3' prime end. They are post-transcriptionally modified. And what we do know when we look where are these modified RNAs, they're in different parts of the cell, and mm -hmm. we know that HCV only uses a subset of microRNAs. So we want to know, is this a specialized microRNA 1 to 2 that has particular sequences at the 3' prime end? And uh, yes, right. and uh, so can we, if we identify those, can we sure. more directly target them? And of course, the big question is from what is uh, microRNA 1 to 2 protecting hepatitis C virus. So we're doing some uh, SI RNA based genome wide screens to identify the genes. When knocked down, maybe then the virus doesn't need uh, microRNA 1 to 2 to uh, sure. maintain HCV RNA abundance. So do you have HCV infectious cell culture models in your laboratory? Right, right. You can take virus and infect cells and. Right. We have a different genotypes and uh, they are infectious. We can, uh, yeah, have a cDNA, manipulate the cDNA and uh, recover virus. <coughs> Do you continue to work on irises also? 
Yes, uh, we do. Although right now, at at the moment, uh, with uh, only few, uh, with uh, fewer people. Right. But uh, yeah, we we have been interested in uh, whether uh, ribosomes that bind to irises are specialized. It's just something different about these ribosomes. So we have done in collaboration with uh, Jennifer Doudna and Laurie Colstead at UC Berkeley proteomic analysis. And uh, what we have found is that uh, some ribosomes that bind to RNA that are translated uh, have a different set of non-ribosomal proteins associated with them than ribosomes that are not engaged in translation. But so far, we have not really found any thing specific for irises. But of course, we might have missed it during the pur purification of ribosomes. But so I'm still very interested in, is a ribosome uh, special that binds to an iris? And right. I think that's kind of the newer frontier with irises. So far, people have isolated iris elements, made mutant mutants, sure, and, sure. and look what binds to them. But what about the ribosome? You know, is there something special that brings them uh, to the iris? So when you're not doing virology, what do you like to do? Well, I like to, uh, I like a lot to go to the theater and, uh, mm -hmm. I like to go to see a theater, musicals, opera, and also I enjoy very much reading. And uh, any other time I have, I go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> Stay healthy. Yes. <laughs> well, we, we should mention we're in Peter's home and, uh, <clears throat> the couch he is sitting on, one leg is broken and it's on a book. It's collapsed by Jared Diamond. <laughs> Did you read that? No, it's uh, my son's book. <laughs> Dude, he's, he's, we actually have picked some other books uh, that he's written. Guns, Germs, and Steel. Do you right, know that right. one? <laughs> On Twiv before. Uh -huh. I wanted to read one email. For, we get a lot of email mm -hmm. on Twiv. And I want to just read one uh, to show you. This is actually someone from Europe. And it might be that you can give him some advice. So he writes, Bonjour Twiv community. I discovered your podcasts a couple of months ago and love to listen to them each week to learn news and virology from my country in France. I don't have a direct question about one of the exciting topics from your recent podcast, but I ask for advice. So Jerome is from Normandy, France. I, I After my PhD in Germany, Heidelberg, where I started my second education as a virologist, I went as a postdoc to the gorgeous city of Portland in Oregon <laughs> to work in the laboratory of Dr. J. Nelson. Uh -huh. Dr. J. Nelson is known for his topics on cytomegaloviruses and West Nile virus research. I stayed six years in his laboratory working at first on SARS coronavirus, which had to be stopped eight months later because of deletion of funding. Then I worked on seven other risky projects on HCMV. Finally, I got one good paper from the last HCMV project and had to move back to Europe because of the end of my contract. I should move one more time after this long period as postdoc by Jay. I, want, I just want to add that despite weak, despite weak publications, I learned a lot during this time. Back in France, I'm still looking for the next postdoc position as a virologist or in R&D in food industry, my primary education. Question, I'm looking for advice to continue my passion for pathogen-host interactions and to combine my high interest in nutrition and chronic diseases during viral infections because I speak and write three languages, French, English, and German, and love to live worldwide despite being French. <laughs> I am very flexible for relocation. However, I could not meet the right people having an interest in my profile at the university, in industry, or in nonprofit organizations like WHO. Which way you will look to find them in Europe, in the States, or worldwide? After so many years working in virology, I don't want to abolish my knowledge and start over with some work just to pay the bills. My science story should not be sad, but rich in adventures like my private life. Thanks for any advice or opportunities. Uh, I thank you for your podcasts on viruses. I'm listening to only podcasts on science or travel in three different languages. So he's asking for advice on how to basically continue his career in virology. Right. Well, it sounds like he's very, very curious about science and loves discovery and uh, try to, uh, yeah, uh, get secrets from nature. And I think that's great. I, I, I love this kind of mind. It's very difficult these days uh, to go across countries and get funding 
And uh, as you know, sometimes it's hard to pay for now with uh, particular uh, amounts and pots of money. And uh, yeah, I don't know about his uh, thinking about industry and uh, it looks like he has tried it. But I think he should continue to uh, to foster his uh, curiosity about science, maybe going into teaching. It sounds like this person might be a very good teacher. Yeah. yeah. And um, it, as you know, there are teaching can be done at ma very different levels, uh, younger children. or, And I think that's a very important mission we have, and uh, to teach the next generation, to teach undergraduates and graduate students. And this person seems to be very, uh, very curious about science and loves to share it. So that would be uh, maybe a suggestion. Should also, I would also suggest going to a meeting. Mm -hmm. Maybe in Europe, if if that if it's not possible to come here, I mean, here in the U.S., the American Society for Virology meetings are always great for meeting people. Yeah. But if you can't make it here, there are many virology meetings in Europe, and uh, you just go and talk and see what's available. Right. The other thing I would recommend is with the internet now, you can look for jobs online, and there are very there are many very specific. Uh, websites for just science jobs. Mm -hmm. All the journals have uh, job opportunities online, and then there are, should I say, uh, Facebook-like sites for scientists. There are many of them. One of them that I know, which I started, is called BioCrowd.com, but there are many, there are about ten others as well, where you can just sign up and interact with the community and see if things are available. And there are actually quite a few job postings on BioCrowd and many of the other sites as well. So I would check that out. But don't give up. Just keep trying. I don't know what you're doing now, Jerome, but um, the key is if you want to do something, you should pursue it. Right. Right? Right. And don't quit. <laughs> so that's the kind of email we get. We get email from all over the world from dozens that's great. of people. <clears throat> and I, I just think uh, it's a wonderful resource for the community to learn about uh, viruses and what's going on. I know that there's a great Rodin exhibition on campus, right? right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, so we, uh, Harry Greenberg was telling me last night, there's uh, uh, the second largest Rodin collection in the world is here. That's right, yeah. So in front of the museum, I think there are about 10 or 15 statues, yeah, including the hmm. gates of hell. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. That's amazing, right? Yeah. So very often uh, when I have a visitor, especially someone from another country, uh, yeah. we just stroll through the Rodin Garden and talk about science or walk through the museum and, and uh, yeah. Well, that's it's a great thing to do if you're at Stanford. And I understand you can just walk on campus and see this. That's right. right? It's not <clears throat> science, but it's important anyway. Yeah. Well, Peter, thank you for talking to me. I really appreciate oh, thanks. it. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. I love uh, talking about virology, and <laughs> I figured I'm here on vacation, but I figured since we were visiting you, that would be a great thing to do. And I'm going to move down the coast uh, in a few weeks, and hopefully, also talk with Bert Semler, my other virology friend out here on the west coast, right, about and, what he's doing. And he knows much more about irises. <laughs> Yes, that's right. So he also does work on viruses as well as uh, as on irises as well as other topics of uh, coronavirus replication. But it's in, there is a lot of virology in California, mm -hmm. right? Right. Unfortunately, in vi virology in general is uh, science in general is very difficult to continue with because funding is harder and harder. Right. And what what do you think about that? I mean, what's the future? Are we in a cycle where we're at the bottom of the trough in terms of support or? And we're going to go up again, or is or are we always going to be at this difficult level? Well, yes, I I mean, talking and interacting with people from the NIH, uh, it looks like uh, times will be tougher, and maybe we should seriously think how many people we are going to train to yeah. to stay in academia. But on the other hand, of course, there are so many opportunities, different opportunities out there than at the time when you and I were finishing sure, our postdoc. Sure. It's, it's really amazing. I mean, we have students or postdoc who go into industry, uh, who go into uh, become a biotech lawyer, completely uh, new fields I have never thought about when I was a postdoc or a graduate student. 
uh, people who become science writers, people who become editors, uh, work with one of the many wonderful journals. There's a lot of opportunity out there. You don't necessarily have to uh, be a PI. Yeah. And there are many opportunities out there if to to go on with your love for science. But uh, the funding, I don't know. I mean, the economy, as we all know, it's it's tough. And uh, we all have to, yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of other sciences in this country that want to be funded as well, besides virology. <laughs> right. And right. Uh, everyone deserves to be able to work on what they want to do, mm -hmm. right? Right. That's what discovery comes from, pursuing what interests you. So uh, you have to split up the pie equally, right. really. Right. That's the tough. That's the tough part of it. Anyway, thanks, Peter. Great talking to you. Sure, thanks. Come back. My sometime. pleasure, Vince. Hello, everyone. I'm back. It's September third, so a few weeks after I've spoken with Peter Sarno, I am now in the gracious home of my good friend Bert Semler. Hey, Bert. Hi, Vincent. How well, are you? Welcome to Twiv, <laughs> yeah. Bert. I'm at Bert's home in none other than San Clemente which some of you rem may remember as the site of the Western White House. Is that right? That's right. Richard Nixon's administration. Yeah. Those of us who were young enough. I do remember. He used to come here. Was it the first Western White House ever? Yeah. And he, was, uh, he used to come here for his um, summer vacations, time away from Washington, uh, usually to escape the other criminals that were doing <laughs> Doing business and when on the he, East Coast. And when he resigned, did he come here? Yes, he came and here. And lived for a while. He lived here for a while. He didn't actually own the property, as, as we discussed earlier. <laughs> B.B. Rebozo owned, I think B.B. Rebozo owned the property. And then, actually, he moved um, to, New, to New, Jersey New Jersey first. Yeah. And lived not too far from where I grew up. Yeah. And initially, the, um, the condo association tried to keep him out of there. Uh, not because of his reputation right. as president, because they thought it would... Uh, it, attract too much attention. That's right. Yeah. And then he moved to New York City. Yeah. Anyway, but we're not here to talk about Richard Nixon. We're here to talk about Bert and his work. Bert is a professor at the University of Irvine. University of California, Irvine. University of California, Irvine. Yeah. What did you call it before? Irvana. Irvana. Yes. I-R-V-A-N-A. <laughs> Irvana. And the department is microbiology and molecular genetics. That's right. In the School of Medicine. School of Medicine. You're a professor. You were chair at one time. For more than 10 years. Did you like that? Uh, it was a good thing, actually. Um, but it was, it was time to step down, have someone else take over, and you know, lead the department in new directions. But, so uh, if, if you could give advice to people listening, and if anyone had the opportunity to be chair where they are, should they take it or not? Well, it depends on their situation. Uh, I would say that a, a, a small medical school department, so we have a dozen faculty, that has a lot of uh, uh, you know well-funded, um, active investigators. Right, it's a good place. But if you're a chair at an undergraduate institution that has a huge undergraduate teaching load, and perhaps not as many people that are funded or active in research, your job might be a little more difficult. I think twice mm -hmm. about that. So you've been at Irvine or Irvana all your career. Yeah. Been a, you went from assistant professor. You came here what year? 80? 80, 83. 83. Yeah. So, so the 20, year after I went to Columbia. Yeah. 27 I say, years. I should say I met you in 81. No, yeah. no, no. It had to be earlier than no, that. No, 81. It was the Gordon Conference in 1981. And I met you in Stony Brook, remember? You were down in the basement. That, that's right. That was in 1979. <laughs> so in 1979, I was finishing my PhD. I went to interview for a postdoc position with Eckhart Wimmer at Stony Brook. University of, uh, what is it? State University. State University of New York, Stony Brook, out in Long Island. And you were there at the time. You had just arrived. I had just arrived. Yeah. And that's where I met you. Right, right. And that's where you did your postdoc, and you worked on poliovirus. Right. That's where you met poliovirus, in that's fact. Right. Before that, you were, let me see if I get your history right. You were a PhD student with John Holland, correct? That's correct, yeah, at UC San Diego. UC San Diego. And yeah. I love your story of John Holland gradient purifying vesicular stomatitis virus. Big fat bands on, on sucrose gradients. Those are sucrose gradients. Yeah, that you could actually 
pull out with a Pasteur pipette. You go in a darkened room right. and you'd illuminate with just with a little spotlight on top and you could see this big sort of just pull grayish band and pull it right out. But of I there. thought John took the tube and put his thumb on top and poked a hole in the bottom and just dripped it like that. That was John Mudd, a senior postdoctoral in his fellow lab? in the lab. Oh, okay. He was the guy who did that and that's exactly what he did. And before you were a PhD student, where'd you go to college? I was an undergraduate at UC Irvine. Um, and I was a, uh, I did my research in orga synthetic organic chemistry. Wow. Yeah. Now, um, John Holland was at San Diego, UC San Diego. Right. So you're a California guy. Right. Born here as well? Yes. Where, where were you born? In born in San Gabriel Valley, not far from Pasadena. And raised as well. Yep. So you never left California except for those few years in... Uh, Four years on Long Island. Long Island. Yeah. Which yeah. you quickly put behind you and came back out here. Right? Yeah. But they were good four years. I enjoyed my time on the East Coast. So you went to do a PhD with John Holland. Now, why did you end up doing viruses? Just serendipity or you liked what he was doing? Well, it was, it, it's interesting how I actually ended up there. So when I was working as an undergraduate researcher in organic chemistry, I went to my organic chemistry professor and told him that I really was interested in molecular biology more than organic chemistry. And he was quite disappointed because he s said, oh, you'll make a good chemist, blah, blah. And, and I said, well, I'm really, I really got bitten by the molecular biology bug. And he said, I said, do you know anybody that, you know, any institutions or anything that work, you know, where they work on that? And he said, you know, I don't know much about molecular biology, but there was a guy who used to work at UC Irvine, who was actually the founding chair of molecular biology and biochemistry, a guy named John Holland. And he moved subsequently to UC San Diego. He said, if you get a chance to work in his lab, you ought to check it out because this guy is brilliant. And he's a terrific scientist. No, I didn't know John was at Irvine. Yeah, he was the founding chair of, of your department. No, not in my department. He was on the main campus. I'm in okay, the medical you're school. You're in the medical school. Yeah, and he was the founding chair of molecular biology and biochemistry and left under uh, um, not optimal circumstances because he was not happy with how the medical school, which was just coming to, uh, to be, was being organized. And so he, he had some differences actually with the chancellor and said, I, I can't stay here under those circumstances. Mm. So he left and went to UC San Diego. And there he spent the rest of his career yeah. and retired some time ago. Yes. Right? Yeah. So you got the virology bug with John. You worked on VSV. Vesicular, vesicular stomatitis, stomatitis virus, virus. Defective interfering particles. Which are? Yeah, are truncated versions of uh, basically infectious virus particles that have deletions in the genome mm -hmm. that are missing portions of the genome that make render them non-infectious. But if they are present in a co-infection with the wild-type virus, they can be replicated and in some cases actually be preferentially replicated. And that's been shown for influenza, rabies, vesicular stomatitis virus, and some of the other RNA viruses as well. I know they're very easy to make with VSV because if you just infect cells at a high multiplicity, you're likely to get yep. these defective particles. Yeah. And, and if you remember, that was actually the def defectives were actually discovered for influenza by von Magnus, so-called von mm -hmm. Magnus phenomenon, because as he kept doing these repeated multiple high multiplicity passages, um, he kept getting lower titers. And it's because he was generating defective interfering particles with influenza virus. And then uh, they were found with other RNA viruses uh, after that. <clears throat> so these are deletions that randomly occur. That's correct. They replicate more efficiently. Presumably. That, presumably that's the case. They replicate more efficiently. Um, because maybe they have shorter genome size, they have slight, some of them have slightly different end sequences th that make them more, perhaps more attractive candidates for replication complexes to form. That but actually has not been completely worked out with all viruses yeah. yet. And for a while we thought they might have some relevance in disease. Yeah, right? in persistent infections. Because uh, uh, Holland did a number of experimental studies with both with cell culture, but also with mouse studies where defective interfering particles were co-infected with uh, wild type virus. Mm -hmm. And they clearly were shown in, in these in animal models to dampen down the, uh, right. uh, uh, the infection and lead to persistence. But in, in uh, human infections, there's not a lot of evidence that defective interfering particles play a role in modulating disease. Now, different viruses make DI or defective interfering particles at different efficiencies. It's very hard to do it with polio. That's correct. Uh, I remember there was a, a student in our lab, an undergraduate student, um, Marcella McClure, who was doing multiple passages and dozens and dozens of passages, these high multiplicity passages, and it 
I don't, you know, it took her like, I don't know, more than 100 passages before mm. she could really get uh, uh, DI particles. Do we understand that? No. Not at all. No. But, but as you well know, since you generated some of them, you can generate the equivalent of um, defective interfering particles uh, you know, through genetic engineering That's of right. poliovirus, and those uh, are quite efficient at replication. Yes, we just delete the coding region for the capsid proteins of polio, as long as you do it in frame so that the downstream proteins are still made, that will replicate and it does interfere. Yeah. And we have to do this because it's a single long protein that's encoded by the genome. But I know that when, when we make poliovirus stocks, we run out, we just infect fresh cells at a high multiplicity. We do that over and over and over. We don't worry about DI particles. But with VSV, if you do one high multiplicity infection, you get defective particles. Yep. It's amazing how different it is. Yeah. But and, you, we, and not only that, but you can, you can do plaque purifications. So plaque to plaque purifications, seemingly that you're so somehow that you're going to get, you know, a, a DI free stock. And you still uh, get them. You still get them. Now you worked on this before the era of molecular biology and recombinant DNA technology, Certainly right? Certainly before recombinant DNA technology, yes. So you, you couldn't clone anything and you could, it was very hard to sequence. Oh, yeah. I'll bet you used RNAs T1 fingerprinting to characterize. We did a lot of RNAs T1 fingerprinting. You know, at that time that you could just start to do enzymatic sequ sequencing of RNA directly. Mm -hmm, right. And also what was called wandering spot technique for that. Right. And so we were actually working on that in John Holland's lab to try to characterize the sequences that were at the very ends of the, of the genomic RNAs, both of the DI particles and the wild type versions of vesicular stomatitis virus. See if we could get a clue about whether the ends were complementary and whether those, those complementary ends were the reason that these DI particles sure. had uh, you know, higher replication efficiency. Our careers are parallel in, in many ways because I worked at, on influenza virus for my PhD. I used the same techniques, wandering spot to sequence the RNA, RNAs T1, and then when it became developed, some limited sequencing using different chemicals to degrade the RNA in different ways. Yeah, and that was, as you well remember, not only was it technically very demanding, but it was a big deal if you could get a contiguous sequence sure. of 50 to 100 nucleotides. And uh, contrast that with today, yeah. when you send your, your material to a company to sequence and you get hundreds and hundreds of bases for 10 bucks or yeah. 20 bucks, yeah. Yeah. and you can sequence an entire human genome in a week yeah. for one or two thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah, with all these, yeah, with all these deep sequencing uh, it's platforms. It's amazing. Yeah. So tell me how you decided to uh, to go east and do a postdoc with Eckerd Wimmer. So it's an interesting uh, discussion that I had with John Holland. So I told him that I was very interested in poliovirus. I was really interested in this newly discovered protein called VPG because it looked to me like this was, you know, and it is something fairly unique, but it was also it looked like it was probably involved in replication. And I was very much interested in how viruses replicated. And I thought it would be a good chance for me to switch from negative strand RNA viruses, which is what vesicular stomatitis virus is, to a positive strand virus like poliovirus, um, a picornavirus, but poliovirus is really the, uh, had been at that time anyway, the main picornavirus that had ever been studied. And uh, um, so I talked to John Holland about that and he said, well, he said for picornavirus is really two labs, David Baltimore's lab and Eckhart Wimmer's lab. And he said, if you want to work on another kind of positive strand RNA virus like retroviruses, he said, I'd recommend Howard Temin's lab. And at the time, Howard Temin's lab was, had a two-year wait for postdoctoral fellows. So I said, well, let's, let's stick with polio. And then so I said, what are the pluses and minuses of going to Baltimore's lab at MIT versus Wimmer's lab at uh, um, Stony Brook? And he was very interesting. He said, well, I know David better than I do Eckhart um, because, uh, um, you know, we." Baltimore and I worked together at the same time when we were junior faculty members. Uh, but uh, he said, uh, Baltimore's lab is going to be a little tougher environment for you. It's going to have more postdocs. Uh, it's going to be more competitive. And he said, you might fit better at Stony Brook. 
He said uh, Wimmer will be more engaged in the individual projects going on in the lab because he only has, you know, basically uh, a polio virus lab, not much else going on. He said Baltimore's lab had uh, um, multiple multiple projects going on, and you might have trouble getting his attention. Um, and uh, so he said, uh, all things being equal, other than the prestige factor, he said uh, maybe you should go to Wimmer's lab. So I took his advice hmm. straight up. Interesting. And, yeah, and that's why I went there. So, you know, I also worked first on a negative strand RNA virus, and then I switched to a positive strand virus, and it was David's lab that I ended up going to. So it would have been interesting if we had ended up in the same lab. Uh, yeah, what was, do you think? Do you think we would never be friends? or No, we would have been friends. You think? We yeah. would probably have done pretty well, actually. Yeah, yeah, we would have been friends. I figure that our ultimate test was the fact that we worked in competing labs as postdocs and still liked each other afterward. Pretty, and, and we worked on similar projects. Yeah, Did, yeah. So my initial project, as was yours with Eckhart, was working on the sequence of polio? Yes. Yes. In one way but I was, really, I was really a bit player in the sequence stuff. It was a more senior right, postdoc, right. Kitamura, that was doing it. But I was sort of, because I knew how to sequence directly RNA, I was sort of, my job was to sequence the phi prime end with another graduate student, Glenn Larson, we were the ones that did right. the first 100 nucleotides directly that were a little tougher to get with the dideoxy sequencing method. So, so really, my, my, uh, that was sort of a side project almost, even though I, we were all excited because, it was, as you well know, it was a big deal to, sure. to work on that project. But uh, uh, really, the real project became after the sequence had been determined, and then I was uh, um, looking at the proteolytic cleavage sites it, and trying to figure out what the proteinase recognized in the polyprotein. So we did a lot of protein work and uh, uh, Edmund degradations mm -hmm. uh, to determine the amino terminal sequence of all the cleaved polypeptides. So again, polio makes one long protein and processes it. So you were trying to figure out where the, the cleavages occurred. Yeah, all the processing sites. And at that time, we were pretty sure that they were all carried out by a viral encoded proteinase, but we actually didn't know what that viral encoded proteinase was. There had been a, a report in the literature before I got to the lab that said it was a protein called X, which later was renamed 2C. It's a protein that was in the middle of the genome, and that actually turned out to be erroneous. And it was later determined that the protein was uh, now a protein that's now called 3C. So was that done in Eckhart's lab? That was done in Eckhart's lab, actually, by a, a graduate student in the lab named Ronnie Hanekak. Yeah, gee, did I see her today? Yes, you did, <laughs> just because she happens to be my wife. Yes. And so this got you interested in processing, which you then worked on for many years here at Irvine. That's correct. And do you still do that? We do a little bit of that, but mainly mainly as a tool more than trying to figure out. You know, we, we've learned a lot about the sites of proteolytic processing, active sites of the enzyme, the different forms of the enzyme and what they recognize. Mm -hmm. So now we use mainly that as a, as a tool to, um, in, in the end, actually change the order of cleavage events or perhaps change the kinetics of cleavage events and see how that affects the whole process of viral replication. Um, because, we, because as you know, there are these, uh, um, a number of cleavage sites that are recognized by the viral proteinase, uh, and clearly the virus must have a directed order, it's probably not random, a directed order of events to allow replication complex assembly. What we've been interested in doing is altering that, and now seeing how that affects replication complex assembly, and how we're able to synthesize perhaps the negative strand complement to the genomic RNA mm -hmm. or the actual progeny uh, viral RNAs that ultimately gets get packaged into new virus particles. So one of your main interests has been RNA synthesis, how the virus duplicates its genome. And you're also interested in translation. Yes. So pick, pick one of them and tell us a little bit about yeah, it. Yeah, so we, I'll, I'll pick translation because in the, it's the, it's the the problem that we got uh, interested in more, most recently, mm -hmm. but it's probably the one that's, uh, uh, I, in my mind, a little, a little bit unconventional and, and, and quite interesting and has broader implications for uh, host cell metabolism, say even more so than viral RNA replication. And, and that's because um, these picornavirus genomes have very long 5' prime non-coding region, and unlike a normal cellular eukaryotic mRNA, they're not capped at the 5' prime end, so they don't have a 5' prime 5' prime uh, triphosphate bridge at the very 5' prime end of the RNA, and instead they have a protein, this protein called VPG, that's covalently attached to the RNA. So it means that that genomic RNA 
cannot engage in what's called normal uh, initiation of protein synthesis in a mammalian or eukaryotic cell. So picornaviruses have evolved an alternative way to do that, and that's by taking advantage of this very long 5' non-coding region that has in it what's called an internal ribosome entry site. And that internal ribosome entry site allows the, the host cell ribosome and translation apparatus to bind at an internal site from the RNA, uh, from the terminus of the RNA, and initiate uh, translation somewhat downstream of that. And what happens is that the viral translation is preferentially, uh, preferentially occurs over that of the host cell because the virus actually shuts down the processes that the host, shell, host cell uses for cap-dependent translation and instead the uh, picornavirus RNAs use cap-independent translation. So why does the virus want to accomplish that? Well, it wants to accomplish that because basically it can take over the entire translation apparatus mm -hmm. at the expense of the host cell, there, there, therefore um, thereby amplifying the, the whole uh, number of polypeptides and ultimately the number of genomes and progeny virus particles that come out of the infected cell. So basically if the virus shuts off the host, the host way of translating, mRNA into protein, it has to use a different mechanism, right, right. and that's where the iris comes and in. And that's where the iris comes in. And so what we've been studying over the years is uh, how is that iris actually recognized by the host cell translation apparatus, because the thought is, of course, is that that's not the normal mechanism of translation. Mm -hmm. So we've been looking for uh, specific cellular proteins, host cellular proteins, that may interact with that uh, iris element, that internal ribosome entry site, and somehow act as a, a binding site for the ribosome or a recognition site for the for the small ribosomal subunit, then, al then allows an initiation complex to form and allows the uh, uh, virus then to translate lots and lots of uh, uh, protein. And and why I think it's even more interesting than that is because it turns out that um, a small number, but still a significant fraction, of host cell mRNAs also translate by this iris dependent mechanism. And uh, it's been it's been very, uh, I think, gratifying for those of us who have been working in the translation field to realize that that apparatus for for iris dependent uh, translation initiation is obviously already present mm. in the host cell <laughs> and therefore the host the host cell must have at least some messenger RNAs to take advantage of that that's the way viruses work though yeah. right yeah that's exactly they don't they invent do. anything no, really no they just they just grab on so yeah. when when irises were first discovered did we think that they were unique to viruses well, I think in general, at least in the early days, I think people had such tunnel vision yeah. that they yeah. thought that it was really unique to viruses. And then actually, uh, it was it was Peter Sarno, while he was just finishing up his postdoc in Baltimore's lab and then starting as a, a faculty member at the University of Colorado, that discovered this protein called BIP. It's, it's mRNA, has an iris element, and that uh, under certain conditions during a poliovirus infection, that BIP mRNA was still translated. And so that was really the first discovery of a host cell mRNA that had an iris. It turns out it's a pretty weak iris in terms of high levels of translation versus low level of translation. But it opened up the, opened up the field and, and had us all looking at uh, host cell mRNAs that might have these sequences that didn't use the normal translation right. initiation method. So you're interested in, in host proteins that participate in internal ribosome entry, essentially, but you use a viral iris as a model to pull out these proteins. That's correct. But presumably they're, all f they're functioning for cellular irises as well. Well, and so again, I'm, I'm not sure that we know that yet. We, we know that some of the uh, viral um, iris binding proteins um, are used by multiple viruses, mm -hmm. and we think that at least some of the host uh, cell mRNAs May, may bind those, but the really like, solid functional data for those host cell mRNAs using the same proteins that the viral uh, uh, mRNAs use, uh, it's not real solid yet. I think that's uh, uh, still to come. So what kinds of proteins are we talking about here? Well, you're usually talking about RNA binding proteins. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, what we've seen are they're fairly ubiquitous proteins. And of interest is that some of the proteins, even though they, they are cytoplasmic, mm -hmm. they also have a, a, a fair concentration of them in the nucleus of the infected cell. So that's a bit of a surprise, because you would expect them only to be cytoplasmic RNA binding proteins.
but but uh, because that's where translation occurs. Yeah, translation occurs in the cytoplasm, mm -hmm. and in fact, for all of the picornaviruses, as you know, the uh, uh, the entire uh, replication cycle occurs in the cytoplasm. So they really shouldn't uh, shouldn't uh, have evolved to use uh, nuclear proteins, or at least proteins that are have high concentrations in the nucleus. But aren't there some that are relocalized? Well, so what what we found is that uh, uh, within a couple of hours post infection, at least mm -hmm. for polio and rhinovirus, most likely Coxsackie virus as well, uh, nuclear proteins are actually relocalized from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, and nuclear cytoplasmic traffic has actually been changed as a result of viral infection, presumably because the virus proteinases uh, carry out cleavage events that disrupt uh, uh, the nuclear porins that are present at the uh, um, nuclear envelope, and either change the export of proteins uh, from the nucleus to the cytoplasm or alter the import of proteins as they would normally go into the nucleus. It's amazing that this has evolved this way. I mean, do you, re do you think that the interfering with nuclear cytoplasmic traffic has other consequences as well, or is it specifically designed to use nuclear proteins in the cytoplasm. I would guess that it probably has to do with, uh, you know, blocking of uh, the innate immune yeah. response and shielding the viruses from that. But it's it's probably not not a side event, uh, a, you know, an inconsequential event that they do that for the RNA binding proteins for translation because the nucleus is loaded with RNA binding proteins. So the virus, you know, uh, a virus evolving to take advantage of that, make sure that those get re right. relocalized right. into the uh, cytoplasm of the infected cell. Now some of the proteins you have identified, and PCB2, PCBP2 comes to mind, have other functions in the cell yet are required for the virus for this mode of translation. Right. Are there other proteins involved in iris-mediated initi initiation that are also in involved in the same process in the cell? The answer is probably, I'm, I'm trying to think if I know of, of any of them. So most of the proteins that are involved in iris-dependent translation um, have functions in splicing or mRNA metabolism or mRNA stability. But in, mm -hmm. in uh, translation functions themselves, uh, maybe a, a, at least a couple of examples have been cited. So one of the proteins that we've been working on is a protein called SRP20. And S SR proteins are serine arginine-enriched proteins that are involved in, in uh, both uh, splicing uh, at the constitutive level um, and um, they're involved in getting mRNAs out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm and maturing as, as, uh, uh, as basically spliced uh, uh, products. Mm -hmm. um, but SRP20 is one of the proteins that relocalizes dramatically from the nucleus to the cytoplasm during a poliovirus infection. And it's interesting because its normal function is in, is in splicing, mm -hmm. but it's also yeah. one of the uh, proteins that shuttles between the nucleus to the cytoplasm and it binds RNA and, and causes these RNAs to shuttle between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. So, so in, in some ways, that's a protein that has a similar function during the course of a normal uh, cellular me metabolism mm -hmm. that the virus has co-opted. Now, SRP20 has not been shown to be directly involved in host cell translation, but other SR proteins, ASF2 and a number of other proteins, mm -hmm. uh, at least at least ASF2 has been shown to be involved in uh, uh, host cell translation, and that's a, an SR protein. So that class of proteins in seems, in, in normal cap dependent translation, translation not 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 iris dependent. dependent in normal cap dependent translation. I think it's a protein called ASF2. Mm -hmm. So that at least brings it into the same general category. That's right. But in fact, it's really hard to show that a cell protein is involved in translation of a cell mRNA by an iris-dependent mechanism, right? Yes. Yeah, it's very difficult because all of those host cell um, mRNAs, of course, initially are generated in the nucleus. So they're transcribed right. in the nucleus, they're processed, and then they're exported from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. And so one of the things that we've thought about is that Perhaps the reason that the viruses have evolved to use um, some nuclear proteins in this is that because those nuclear proteins may actually be involved 
in host cell mRNA translation, perhaps on irises. We haven't shown that yet, at least to any great extent. Um, but that may that may be the real may be the real issue. And what we're thinking is that perhaps during mRNA synthesis and maturation and that splicing pro uh, uh, process, that some of those proteins stay bound to the mRNA as they go out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm. And those, those RNP complexes, so RNA protein complexes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. those perhaps are targets for uh, ribosome assembly and iris-dependent translation. So the trick then is to develop an experimental system that can track a eukaryotic mRNA that we think has an iris element, internal mm -hmm. ribosome entry site, and then track it all the way through and see what proteins are bound to it and right. on an active translation complex. Right. So, so we do have, you have... Do you have such a uh, eukaryotic mRNA in mind? We don't. Oh, we have a couple of them in mind that yeah. we'd like to study. Uh, a colleague of mine at, uh, at UC Irvine, uh, Marion Waterman, is, is studying an mRNA called LEF, and lymphoid enhance, enhancer factor uh, mRNA, mm -hmm. and it has an iris. Mm -hmm. And it's a, obviously synthesized in the, in the nucleus and goes out into the cytoplasm. And she and her colleagues there are uh, carrying out uh, a very high-tech mass spec analysis uh, after a, a, a cross-linking study to try to see if they can t tag those mRNA with the proteins that are bound mm -hmm. to them in active complexes. So far, they haven't, uh, they haven't succeeded in identifying the, the array of proteins, but I think it's a very promising uh, methodology that they're using. So you would, they would identify proteins bound to this cellular iris. And then how do you show that they have a functional? Well, role? I think then you have to go back and, and, you know, do depletion studies using siRNA of the mRNAs or some kind of way that you can reload those proteins in the cell or even develop a cell-free assay. The problem with the cell-free assay, uh, basically in vitro translation assay, is it works really well for RNA viruses that are cytoplasmic, but it doesn't work so well for, for transcripts that start out as precursor transcripts and then have to get processed yeah. Yeah. and then go into the cytoplasm. So that's a little bit of a shortcoming. And it's, it's, that's sort of the uh, Achilles heel of all of the cellular iris studies and uh, their, 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 their main detractors have said because of this whole idea of having to go from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, maybe all of this smacks of an artifact and you don't really have what's called a real iris element. Mm -hmm. And so it's the, of course, the onus is on all of us to try to, to try to get around those criticisms it, and having a really good cell-free assay that reconstructs that event it perhaps would have to have nuclei, active nuclei, in that cell-free assay. Why is it important to understand any of this to, for the for the my listeners out there who are baffled by this? Why should we be understanding the how these cellular irises work at this level of detail? Well, because the it it, it looks at least uh, from the initial studies mm -hmm. that the cellular irises uh, are particularly important for cells uh, for mRNAs that are important for cells going through mitosis, uh, cells going through uh, heat shock and apoptosis. So it may be that these kinds of mRNAs are very important for either cell duplication or survival of the cell under, under stress conditions. So that when normal host cell translation is shut down mm -hmm. under stress conditions, some of these mRNAs are still allowed to be translated to produce the proteins that allow the cell and ultimately the organism to survive under those conditions. So that's why it's important for us to know. How about cancer? Can we bring that into the argument? We can, we can well? certainly bring that into cancer because a number of the mRNAs that have uh, internal ribosome entry sites, mm -hmm. um, those uh, uh, cellular mRNAs are in fact uh, upregulated in certain cancers and are certainly important for uh, uh, control of, of cellular metabolic activity. Uh, CMYK being a major one and another uh, protein called VEGF. And both of those uh, uh, proteins have been shown, their expression have been shown to be altered in a big way in many forms of cancer. And so both of them are known to be translated by mm -hmm. this iris uh, mechanism. So where does your real interest lie? Are you more interested in the viral mechanisms of viral irises or cellular or no i'm still most more interested in the mechanism of viral irises because the systems are much cleaner for mm -hmm. studying them and because my at heart i'm a reductionist i think we'll ultimately get down to the mechanism that says 
when we have an internal ribosome intracyte synthesizing mRNAs for picornaviruses and other RNA viruses, we can say that this group, this complex of RNA binding proteins assembles perhaps in a stepwise fashion. And then that's recognized to form as a, basically as a nucleation site mm -hmm. to form mm -hmm. a larger complex than, al than allows the translation initiation of, of the viral mRNA. And further down the, the road, as I, as I sunset in the, in the world of science, maybe I'll be interested in, in trying to set up more complex assays, uh, that will allow us to, go after these uh, uh, host cell mRNAs that require this mm -hmm. nuclear experience. So most of your iris work has been done with polio so far? That's correct. Are you starting to think about other picornavirus irises, or is it going to be polio? No, we've way? been, for a number of years now, we've been working on the rhinovirus iris as well as Coxsackie virus iris. And, and there are some subtle differences uh, between mm -hmm. those, those iris elements, and we're trying to see if those subtle differences have anything to do with their different gene expression patterns compared to polio, and also whether there's any cell type specificity of those uh, um, mechanisms. What's the Im importance of cell type specificity? Well, the cell type specificity means that if the if the virus can, even if the virus can infect a certain cell, if it's limited in its ability to translate because it's missing proteins or or some signals that that you know that would be. Uh, yeah. Allow that would allow the virus mm. to translate. Um, then that would might tell you how the virus gets access to a certain type of cell in a certain type of tissue, and how it's excluded right. from expression in other types of cells and tissues. As you know, uh, we are under the sword of polio eradication, Damocles, the sword of Damocles of polio eradication. But you could continue to work on the polio iris long after no one else could work on polio virus because you just need a small piece of the genome. Is that right? That's correct. In theory, you couldn't do some of the experiments maybe involving infected cells, but right. But we can so, certainly we have a lot of uh, uh, reporter assays that take advantage of uh, you know very sensitive uh, methodologies that don't require infectious right. virus at all. But of course, you are left with the fact that ultimately we love to test. Whether it's uh, what its effect is on the actual virus yield sure. and the steps in virus replication, and that so you could not do. That yeah. we could not do, but we can certainly do it with rhinovirus and with Coxsackie virus. So we'll be able to have at least some version of that same uh, um, assay for effects on virus replication. Which are road. perfectly valid viruses to work on in terms of human disease, also. Oh, absolutely. Right? Have you thought about working on the iris? of some of these newly discovered picornaviruses. For example, there are these so-called cosaviruses isolated from children in Afghanistan and Pakistan. There are newly discovered rhinoviruses, and these have somewhat different iris elements. Have you ever thought about that and what what value that would be? Well, it, it, it may, you know, that may provide some uh, some value because at least a couple of the new type C uh, rhinoviruses so far can't be uh, grown in culture. And it's not clear why they can't be grown in culture. So although we haven't actually stepped into that arena yet, it would be very interesting to see if, interesting to see if that actually is that just at the level of virus entry, or is it at the level of translation initiation, or at the level of RNA replication. So there could be, that could be a real uh, um, assay for cell specificity. Seems, cell like type it, specificity. seems like an easy experiment to do. It does. And it's, there are, you know, a couple of people that have identified those uh, viruses have not gone very far That's uh, right. in, in, in taking those next steps. Well, quite often those who identify these novel viruses, their labs don't do the, the next part, which right. is to understand. Sure. So that's left to yeah. the, your lab and to, my lab. To reductionists like us. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. I'm very interested in those as well. Perhaps we can work on them together. Yes. Because as you know, I have a collaborator at Columbia, Ian Lipkin, who's been involved in the isolation of rhino seas. And I've always wanted to work on them. And a very easy experiment is to find out whether if you put the genome into a cell, does it translate or not? Yeah. yeah. And if it does translate, does it replicate? Yes. Yeah. So I mean, what, some of the thinking is that there are receptor issues in the inability of these rhino C's to replicate. We should say that these rhino C's are probably involved in serious respiratory tract disease. And they haven't been identified until recently because you can't grow them. That's right. So sequence methods were, were really needed. So I find those very interesting. And as you know, you always have to think about the funding 
uh, question, whether something can be funded or not. And those to me are very compelling. Yeah, and you know, people a little bit um, poo-poo rhinovirus as well, you know, it's the common cold and yes, it's a human disease, but it's not a particularly serious one. Well, that statement is not correct when you think of people that have uh, upper respiratory disorders, things yes. like asthma and other breathing disorders. When they get a cold, though their disease sequelae are very serious compared to the average, uh, you know, healthy non-immune compromised individual who just gets the common cold. So uh, I think uh, uh, to understand uh, the pathogenesis of, of rhinovirus inf infections is uh, still very important and much more significant than the Absolutely. common cold that gives you the sniffles. Absolutely. Well, Bert, thanks for talking today. Thanks for inviting me into your wonderful home. It's, it's great to have you here, and I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed our conversation very much. And now we can go back to uh, having some fun. Yes. Oh, actually, we had fun. We like talking about viruses. Yes. So that concludes... California Virology. We spoke with Peter Sarno and now Bert Semler. And of course, there's much more California Virology than that, but those are two of my good friends here. And I figured I would talk to them on my trip. So that's the name of this episode, California Virology. You can listen to TWIV on iTunes. You can listen to TWIV at the Zoom Marketplace, or you can listen to TWIV on your smartphone using Stitcher Radio, which is a free app that you can download at, at, on your iPhone or Android device or BlackBerry by going to the App Store and searching for Stitcher Radio. As always, if this is the first time you're listening to TWIV, please go on over to iTunes and leave a comment. It helps us to stay on the front page of the Medicine Podcast Directory. TWIV is a part of sciencepodcasters.org, promednetwork.com, and microbeworld.org, which are websites where you can find great science content. Next week, that is September, what would next Friday be? September 10th. We'll go back to a normal TWIV with our usual hosts. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>